Dear all, thank you for presence. So today we are here uh, to present you the last lecture, number two. So the last lecture has run in academic institutions for a decade. The aim and the purpose of the last lecture is that professors from the university answer the timeless question. If you had one last lecture to give, what wisdom uh, would you uh, impart to your audience? Well, today, uh, for a second time, like last time we had Professor William Knapp, uh, Professor uh, Irene uh, Janet Schick will join us, and uh, it's the face that will always smile to you, even when from far. It's a hand that will always wave to you, even from far. Warmness and care from the voice that will never stay unspoken. Small but li lively eyes looking at you, seeing only best in you. So if you may please join us and share your wisdom with us. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, Leila, for, for the incredibly generous introduction and also for explaining what the last lecture is all about. Uh, because I got many, many inquiries over the last several days uh, about uh, what on earth is this? Are you leaving? Are you dying? You know, what's, what's going on? Um, so, uh, no, I'm, I'm not leaving. And I may be dying, but I'm not aware of it. Uh, so um, the, it's a hypothetical question. Uh, if this were my last lecture, what would I wish to say? Um, you know, how would I wish to be remembered? Uh, so um, my plan is to uh, talk for about half an hour and then um, to entertain questions, if, if there are any. Um, so uh, Felister asked me to give this lecture uh, some months ago, and I accepted without realizing how incredibly difficult uh, at, uh, the task would be. And I've been thinking about this on and off for, for quite a while. Um, what's interesting is that, you know, at, at my age, the idea that this lecture or, or any lecture for that matter uh, might be my last is not so theoretical. It's not as theoretical as it might be for, for one of you. Closer, I mean? Oh, the, the, oh, this one. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Can you hear me? All right. So, um, so what I was saying was that. Uh, at my age, the idea that this might be my last lecture is not quite as theoretical as it would be for, for uh, one of you. Um, you know, when one is young, one feels uh, immortal. And even those of you who are intellectually perfectly aware that uh, death can strike at any time, you know, for deep inside, you're confident that it won't. And uh, death is something that just happens to others, you know, never to oneself. But as one changes, the perception changes as well, um, as one ages. Uh, I, some years ago, when I turned 50, I felt basically that my life was over. I was extremely depressed. Um, and this was made worse by the fact that suddenly my health declined. Uh, you know, I had always had wonderful cholesterol. All of a sudden, it went up. I had always had wonderful blood pressure. All of a sudden, it went up. Um, and all kinds of little things were going wrong at the same time. Plus, you know, because we are so uh, 
um, condition to thinking in terms of, of uh, decimals, 50 was like, oh my God, half a century, I'm, I'm finished. You know? So um, my body was telling me that my time is up. My, my decimal con uh, conditioning was telling me that my time is up. And I had had uh, some years earlier some, some serious uh, medical problems as well. So I be began to feel that, you know, not only am I mortal, but uh, that, you know, death is uh, pretty much around the corner, that, that, that it's imminent. And what's interesting is that I found that this is not such a bad thing after all. Uh, in the following sense, you know how it is when you uh, exercise or you run uh, or you, you know, you, uh, you play football or whatever, and suddenly you feel all your muscles, you know, everything aches. And uh, when, when that happens, um, you become conscious of every muscle in your body. You become co conscious of, um, you know, parts of your body that you didn't even know you had because they begin to, to, uh, to uh, tell you that, you know, I'm here and I'm aching. And um, in a month's time, I'll be 58. And, uh, well, 58 is almost 60, and 60 is old, you know? And, uh, wow, you know, how did this happen? Uh, when did this happen? Um, uh, I've always thought of 60 as, as old, and I'm nearly there. And it's kind of shocking to me sometimes to realize where I am. Uh, and, um, you know, there's, there, there's a saying that life is what happens while you're making other plans. And it's, it's true in a way, because I'm, I have no idea where all the time went. Um, it, apparently it passed. Uh, it passed me by, but I, I don't know where it went. But on the other hand, I've, uh, having reached this point, uh, has made me very aware of everything. You know, um, I, uh, I'm, I don't sail through life unaware as I used to. So just like somebody who has uh, just run the marathon, feels all his muscles, I, I feel what's going on. I'm, I'm very aware of what is going on. Um, and, uh, you know, when I live uh, with the consciousness that today may be my last day, um, you know, it, it makes me very aware of, of the beauty that surrounds me. Now, I won't lie to you, it also makes me aware of the ugliness that surrounds me sometimes, but mostly the beauty, that, or at least that's what I prefer to, to, uh, to look at or to see. Um, now, when one, when one is a small child, you know, one has a sense of wonderment. Um, everything is new. Everything is amazing. Everything is, is, is so such a big surprise. And as one grows up, one loses that sense of wonderment. Uh, one becomes blasé, you know, one takes everything for granted. Yeah, yeah, I've seen it before, been there, done that. Uh, and that's a terrible loss. That's, that's a real loss. And what I feel is that, um, yeah, you know, I went through that definitely. But as I've gotten older in, in more recent years, uh, I feel I have regained my sense of wonderment. Um, I, I look at, uh, we were just uh, discussing this with Leila and Felister, I look at my cat, uh, whose name is Duhan, um, and I think, my God, what an amazing creature. How, what, what beautiful eyes he has, you know, what, what soft fur he has, how gracefully he jumps on the, on the, uh, on the, onto the table, what extreme beauty in this tiny little package. Um, and the fact is, I didn't particularly used to feel this way. You know, I used to think, well, yeah, a cat is a cat. You know, a dog is a dog. A flower is a flower. You know, what's, what's the big deal? But I'm finding that as time passes, um, I, 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 I be, I've begun to appreciate things much more. And so this brings me to my first piece of advice uh, of, the, of the day. Do not lose your sense of wonderment. And if you do, or if you already have, Try to regain it. Don't wait until you're my age. Um, start now. And, you know, look at what is around you um, basically as if this is the first time you're seeing it. Appreciate the beauty that surrounds you because there is really a lot of it. Uh, but you have to see it. You have to look for it. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that aging is, is, is perfect. Um, first of all, there is the issue of health. Um, you know, I get out of breath easily. My memory isn't what it used to be. I had incredi an incredible memory. I, rem I could remember everything. Well, not anymore. 
um, I, I have to take four pills every morning. Um, you know, uh, and you know what the worst part is? Um, the worst part is that one's heart, uh, in the sense of, of Gönül, not in the sense of Kalp, uh, one's heart never ages. And so um, what happens is that there is a growing distance between the heart and the body. Um, you know, I'm as romantic today as I was as a teenager. If I, in the street, sometimes I will encounter an appealing young woman, and I will, I will look at her just as I did when I was 20. And she will look at me and, she's, and she will think, oh, this guy looks just like my grandfather. You know, this is not a good feeling. This is really not a good feeling. Uh, so there are downsides to aging, definitely. Um, but on the other hand, uh, I have come to feel much more centered. I feel that I know where I am. I know who I am. I know where my place is. Um, I have found my place. Um, and uh, the fact that it took me a very long time, the fact is that it took me a very long time to come to this point. And I have to be very grateful to God for giving me enough years to reach this point because it's a good place to be. So, okay, what does all this mean in terms of how I live my life? Um, well, for one thing, I'm no longer willing to postpone things. Um, you know what they say, don't leave to tomorrow what you can do today, blah, blah, you know, it's old, old uh, advice. Well, there may not be a tomorrow. So you have to live life accordingly. Um, there is, you know, there is an old cliche, plan as if you will live forever and work as if you will die tomorrow. Once again, after a certain age, this is no longer a theoretical issue. I mean, I may die tomorrow, and so I work accordingly. Um, and I think I waited far too long to reach this point. So here's my second piece of advice. Do not postpone. Do what feels right and do it now. And that means, perhaps, um, that if you feel you are in the wrong academic department, um, do not hesitate to change it. And many people are giggling, so I think I've touched a nerve. Um, disliking what one does on a daily basis is a recipe for unhappiness. And so do not condemn yourself to unhappiness just because of a past mistake that you may have made or that your parents may have made. Take whatever steps are necessary to achieve a, a happy and fulfilling life. And do so now. Don't postpone. But please don't misunderstand me as you know, advocating uh, selfishness or crass individualism. Um, because another thing I have discovered with over the years is the enormous joy of doing good. Not just to people, but to all of creation. Um, you know, be good to cats. Be good to dogs. Be good to birds. Give them water in the summer when it's hot. Give them food. Protect them from the elements. Protect them from cruelty, from cruel people. Um, yes, it's true this is a good deed that will earn you God's approval, but do it also for them, and do it for yourself, because there's really nothing wrong with doing good because it feels good to do, to do good. So uh, it's okay to do good for your own reasons as well. I have an interesting story, actually, um, to tell you. Uh, some years ago, I became acquainted with a, a Polish professor who teaches in the United States. Uh, I bumped into her through the internet, and we still haven't actually come face to face. We've only written to each other. And she was writing a book about the years that the great American novelist and playwright James Baldwin spent uh, in Istanbul. Uh, James Baldwin was here uh, during the 1960s and early 70s for almost 10 years. Uh, and he closely collaborated with uh, people active in Turkish theater like Engin Cezar and uh, um, uh, Yildiz Kenter and various other people. Um, he's a very, very interesting character. And in any case, as, as it happens, you know, while we were writing to each other, I found some errors in her work, and I told her about them. And so she started asking me various questions, and I helped her in the course of finishing her book. Now, uh, don't get me wrong, uh, I'm, I'm not implying that I had a major part in the book. It's very much her book. But I just helped with little details here and there. But, you know, little or, 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 or large, uh, this took a lot of my time. And um, so at one point, uh, she asked me why I was spending so much time 
helping her. Given that we barely knew each other, we had never actually met face to face, um, she wasn't paying me or anything, so, you know, why was I bothering to help her? And without thinking, I had an answer to her. I said that the aesthetics of the world uh, I live in is very important to me, and for me, a book with errors in it is ugly. And so I said I was helping her not for her uh, sake personally, but in order to make the world a slightly more beautiful place. I didn't really think about this. I wasn't trying to be like wise or deep or anything. I, it, it just came, you know. To learn to forgive others for their and so later on, when she was describing the help I gave her, she said that I had been, and you know, I'll quote you exactly. She said, I had been trying to make the world a more, more beautiful one correction at a time. And I really loved this description. I, I, I loved it so much. I found it so, so, so very, very nice. Yes, it's true that some of the corrections I made were tiny, maybe insignificant, and some were maybe a little more important. But it isn't really how big the errors uh, are. If I know there's an error, no matter how big or small, that takes away from the beauty of the world. And so I want to make the error go away. I want to make the world a more beautiful place. So here's my third piece of advice. Do not underestimate your own potential to make the world more beautiful. Each one of us can actively participate in making the world a more beautiful place. You don't need to be wealthy or have a PhD or be a professor, doctor, somebody. Um, or to be a world-class artist or musician or author. It is in the power of each and every one of us, of you, to contribute to making the world a more beautiful place. And so do it. Do it for your own sake and do it for the, the sake of all the people with whom you share this planet. And speaking of the people with whom you share the planet, Jean-Paul Sartre famously said in his play, No Exit, that hell is the others. In other words, that each one of us has his or her own personal hell, which is made of the people surrounding us. Well, it is certainly true that people have the power to make life hell for us. And indeed, it is remarkable how unnecessarily cruel some people can be and how much pain they can inflict on other people for little or no reason. But ultimately, with every person you encounter, I think you should think to yourself, could it be that this person and I were meant to be close to each other? Could it be that we can be best friends, even soulmates? This is always a possibility. As I said, yes, some people can be cruel. Um, and if so, then you stand corrected. But your initial point should be, could it be that this person and I were meant to be close to each other? Now, I don't mean to sound like, you know, I love everybody and this and that. I can be pretty misanthropic. Uh, and I, you know, I don't really think of myself as a people person. Um, I used to agree with, I don't know if you read Peanuts, the, the cartoon strip, but there is a, a character named Lucy in, the, in Peanuts. And uh, at one point she says, I have nothing against humanity. It's people I can't stand. And, uh, you know, I kind of uh, agreed with her. For, for most of my life. And yet, people constantly surprise me with their depth and with their inner beauty, even when I least expect it. So, my fourth piece of advice would be that each of you should have a, uh, a beauty radar. And your radar should always be turned on. When you meet people, don't dismiss them for being other. Don't, you know, they may be of a different gender, a different class, a different race, a different religion, sexuality, age, nationality, politics. But in the final analysis, your shared humanity is much more important and much more powerful than any such difference. So be sure to always ask yourself, could it be that this person and I were meant to be close to each other? Remember to deal with people on the basis of who they are not what they are. Because, you know, people are not simple. Um, no one can be reduced to one or two or even 500 adjectives. Each person is much more than the sum of his or her parts. Um, if you reduce a person to a few adjectives, 
And that is not only foolish, it robs you of the possibility of experiencing the full wealth of that person. It's not only unfair to that person, it's unfair to yourself. It's unfair to oneself to miss that opportunity. Um, it's a loss. It's a real loss. So I just said I can be misanthropic, and that's the truth. But it's also true that I've changed over my lifetime. I used to be much, much worse. So sometimes when I mention to a recent acquaintance that at some occasion in the past I was furious, I raised my voice, I yelled and screamed, uh, he or she typically says, oh, it's difficult to imagine you doing that. But I'm guilty of having done a lot of that in the past. I used to be judgmental. I used to be unforgiving. There, there, there were two ways of doing things. There was my way and the wrong way. But now I know that this resulted in my being unfair to some people, in that I didn't try to understand them as well as much as I should have. And as a result, I did not get to know them as well as I could have, and thus I robbed myself of the potential opportunity of getting close to someone's inner beauty. So, my fifth piece of advice is this. Don't be too judgmental. Ultimately, every one of you, uh, everyone around you is trying to do just exactly what you're doing. They're trying to survive as best they can. Life is not easy. There are challenges, there are pressures, and we each deal with those pressures in different ways. And sometimes we make mistakes. But we must cut each other some slack. We must give each other a second chance, and perhaps a third one, and even a fourth one. Now, all of this will sound very pious, very holier than thou. Um, and you might wonder, am I able to follow my own advice? Ah, sometimes yes, sometimes no. I'm not telling you that I've achieved all this, these things. I've just, I'm just telling you that I've come to realize how important they are. We need to learn to forgive others for their trespasses. And to do that, we also need to learn to forgive ourselves for our own trespasses. And this is often much, much harder. We are so harsh on ourselves, so uncompromising. We have to learn to show ourselves some understanding, some compassion. We, learn, we have to learn to accept ourselves as we are. And this is very, very hard because many of us measure ourselves against impossibly high standards. But, but we must learn to forgive ourselves. This is really important and it's the key to learning to forgive others. So what else have I learned? For one thing, I've learned the, the importance of, of being many-sided. It is, of course, true that in order to succeed professionally in today's world, one needs to be specialized. It is no accident that specialists make much more money than generalists. Society values expertise. But what about us? What do we value? Personally, I value breadth of horizon. There is so much to know and so little time. And everything you learn connects you to something else, to a part of nature, to another person, to human history. You know, people ask, why bother to study blank? Why bother to study mathematics, history, geography? Why bother to learn English or Turkish or French? Why bother to learn music or art? And the answer is because all of these things put you in touch with the collective heritage of humanity. You get to know people who lived elsewhere at different times, you get to understand what made them tick, um, what they thought, what they felt, what were their hopes and aspirations. You get to feel with their hearts. So acquiring knowledge is not just about learning tricks of the trade that you can apply in your professional lives. It is about establishing connections with the history of humanity, with your fellow humans. And so my sixth piece of advice is this. When you have a chance to learn something new, please don't ask the question, to what use can I put this? You may not know whether or not you will be able to put this knowledge to profit, profitable use in your career, and if so, how? But you can be sure that every morsel that you learn will make you richer, if not financially, then at least spiritually. There is a lot to learn, and we can't possibly learn it all. But if we keep our eyes open, we can still learn quite a bit. 
And this is a cliche, you know, but there is no age to learning. This is literally true. One never ceases to learn, provided that one is willing. I learn new things every day. And here's an example. It is said that when the calligrapher Ahmed Kamil Aktik, who was the last person to hold the title Reis al Hattatin, the, the chief calligrapher, lay on his deathbed, he said, I have only one regret, that I'm dying before having had a chance to really learn calligraphy. Now, you know, this, he was one of the most prominent, most accomplished calligraphers of his time, of, of all history. And yet, this is how he felt as he lay dying. One never, ever stops learning, provided that one is willing to learn. And this suggests a continuous quest for knowledge, doesn't it? But where will this quest take us? Is this just a conceit, accumulating facts for the sake of accumulating facts? One can't help remembering the great um, Anglo-American poet, T.S. Eliot, uh, and his wonderful poem, Four Quartets, which ends as follows. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Our quest, in other words, will not necessarily take us somewhere new, but it will allow us to know our world in a new way. The purpose of the quest is not getting somewhere. The purpose of the quest is self-transformation. It is said that when the Prophet Muhammad returned from battle once, he said, the small jihad is over. Now the greatest jihad begins. What he meant by the greatest jihad was the fight against the self, against one's base desires and instincts, against one's imperfections. Yes, when we make mistakes, we must, of course, forgive ourselves as I said before, but this only makes sense if we are willing to change so that we do not make the same mistake again. In this sense, life is a quest for self-improvement, a quest which for most of us never ends except when we die. Of course, some people are more successful than others at it. Um, there's a couplet attributed to Mevlana Jalaluddin Rumi who said, the summary of my life is these three words, I was raw, I was cooked, I was burnt. Most people don't reach that happy state, but it's good to bear that in mind. Change is a law of nature. Everything changes. Heraclitus said, you cannot step twice into the same river, for other waters are constantly flowing on to you. Trying to stop change is a conceit that is always doomed to fail. The point is not to stay the same, but to change wisely. And so my seventh piece of advice is always to be cautious about terms like progressive and conservative, about claims of historical necessity, of being revolutionary or reactionary. I'm not saying that these terms are not meaningful, they are. I'm just suggesting that their meaning and applicability must always be questioned and debated, and one must always approach them critically. Which means that blind faith and adherence to this political party or that one, to this political leader or that one, is to be avoided at all costs. We must defend principles, values, ideals, not individual actors. And we must always be willing to do so, no matter the cost. It is easy to be ethical when one has nothing to lose. It is much harder when there is a lot at stake. So what principles or values are worth defending? Well, freedom is one, of course, but I define freedom in a very broad manner. Freedom of expression is very important, for example, as is freedom of access to information, but freedom from hunger, from poverty, from violence are just as important. Human rights include freedom from torture, from arbitrary detention, from discrimination on the basis of race, nationality, religion, gender, sexuality. But it should also include the right to decent health care, to proper nutrition, to adequate housing, to education. These also are, should be considered human rights. We must defend those who are less fortunate than us. This is our duty, really, as human beings. The United States Declaration of Independence, which was signed in 1776, as you know, speaks of unalienable rights and gives as examples life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
but none of us can enjoy these rights when others are deprived of them. A society that oppresses one group of people oppresses everyone. The only true guarantee of your freedom, of your right to live, and of your bodily integrity, of your happiness, is that everyone enjoys the same rights. Why, you may ask? Well, because principles are important, for one thing, and because one cannot enjoy a wonderful meal when one is surrounded by starving people, but also because fortunes change. As Isaac Newton supposedly said, what goes up must come down. And those who are in power now will eventually be out of power, just as those who were in power before are now out of power. And also because oppression really has a cost. Oppressing women, for example, means locking men into certain gender roles with, with which they may not always be happy. Oppressing minorities means fighting to maintain inequality and dying in the process. No one is free when others are oppressed. This is not just a theoretical statement, it is often literally true. So what can we do? What must we do? We must get involved. We must organize. Often people say, I'm not a joiner. I don't like organizations. And certainly I can sympathize with that. But we have much more power as a group than as individuals. So if we want to change the world, and by the way, if you've been looking around lately, you know that the world badly needs changing, then we must organize. There are many causes that deserve our support. We must protect the environment. We must come to terms with the fact that animals have rights and deserve a decent life. We must speak up against the oppression of women. We must seek peace. We must end this senseless war in the East that has cost tens of thousands of lives. We must end discrimination against minorities, especially against gypsies, whose situation remains absolutely critical in our country. We must firmly oppose the continuing restrictions on the freedom of speech and association and of free access to information. And we must strongly support legal reforms which are long overdue and continue to tarnish our country's human rights record. At the same time, we must support oppressed people elsewhere, in Palestine, in China, in Sri Lanka, in Syria, without focusing only on the people we like. It is not only Muslims who face oppression across the world, but millions of others as well. We cannot afford to ignore their plight. And we must learn not to hate. We can hate oppression, we can hate injustice, but we must not hate entire groups of people. There is so much hatred in this country. There's hatred of Jews, of Armenians, of Alevis, of Kurds, of gays. Hatred is a poison, and it inflicts the most damage not on those who are hated, but on those who hate. This, in fact, was the message that Rand Dink tried so hard to convey, the message that was deliberately misunderstood by the court that sentenced him to prison, supposedly for insulting Turkishness. Okay, people have been living and dying for hundreds of thousands of years, and it is very difficult to say anything on the subject that has not been said before. Inevitably, one ends up resorting to cliches, and I'm sure I have done so many times throughout this talk. But no matter, what I've been saying is heartfelt. We are born, we live together, uh, all together uh, very short lives, and we die. And our lives would be utterly meaningless if we did not try to make a contribution to the world that has hosted us during this time. So, okay, my final word of advice is this. Live to make the world a better place and do your very best to leave it just a tiny bit more beautiful than you found it. Ultimately, this is all that any one of us can hope. Thanks for listening. So, um, if you have questions, I'll be happy to take them. Yes? You've been doing this for a long time, so um, have ever this reality felt unreal to you? Yes. Yes. Um, th ah, yes. Um, it's, it's, it has to do with this sense of wonderment that I was telling you about. There are times, I, I mean, um, I think 
when one has stopped being a child, uh, but one has not become old, um, one loses a sense of wonderment and one begins to just take things for granted. Everything seems the way it should be. Um, whereas after a certain point, you begin to see how amazing everything is and uh, how unbelievable everything is. Um, you know, I, I live this both in my, uh, in my professional life, for example, um, if I do, uh, if I am proving a, a mathematical theorem, sometimes I, I don't know where it's coming from as I write the solution down. You know, as I write the proof down, it's like it's coming from somewhere else and I'm just the, the secretary, the scribe. Um, I, 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 I do artwork as well. I've always drawn uh, all my life. And it's the same thing there. It's, it's unreal in the sense that it comes out of somewhere, which is not me. It, it's some, it's my pen does things without me knowing really where it's coming from. Uh, so so that, there is certainly a lot of that. I don't know if this uh, answers your question, but yes. No, okay. So, uh, like, I feel really honored, like, listening to your lecture, first of all. Thank you. Uh, I don't have you, like, in any lectures, but now I'm really, dis like, disappointed that I don't have you. Uh, but my question is, like, when was the moment that you felt that you're making a difference in this world? Ah, that's such a, such a good question. I think that... Huh. Wow. Okay. Uh, I think um, I've always tried, uh, but for the most, for the longest time, I was not very. I was skeptical. Okay. Uh, for example, I was politically very active when I was young, but it was really like a game, to be honest. You know, I mean, we were trying, we were doing things, um, you know, almost according to a scenario. You know, we were doing what we were expected to do. Um, you know, we were on one side of politics, the other group was on the other side, and we all, we, we read the rules of the game and we played the game. Um, I think the point when I began to feel that I could have a, a, an influence is uh, probably once, probably when I started teaching, I think. Um, because first of all, I, rem I still remember uh, a few professors who made a big difference in my life. And so I feel, wow, you know, if I can do that, that, that would be incredible. And, um, and also the other thing is that um, after I have, I have uh, once after I, ha I had been active enough for, it, for, it, for enough time, I realized that the people that we see on television or read about in newspapers, you know, the leaders, the whatevers, they're really like us, you know? They, they, there isn't a huge difference between them and us. Um, maybe they're lucky they got a break at some point, or maybe they're more driven. And you know, I don't want to be prime minister, frankly. And Recep Tayyip Erdogan wants to be prime minister, so okay, he becomes prime minister. I don't. But ultimately, there isn't a huge difference in terms of you know, he's a person, he's a human being, he has weaknesses. We all do. Um, and so, in that sense, I began to realize that it's not only the the leaders and the experts and this and that that change the world. It's, it's everybody, really. So I think that was maybe getting to know enough experts and enough leaders to realize that they're not that different. Maybe that's the point. Thank you for everything, for the firstly. And I appreciate your talk a lot. Thank you. Uh, I want to add that if you had to change a chance to change your decision, any decision, it could be professional, academic, private, emotionally, whatever, something important, unimportant. But I'm just curious, if you had the chance, chance to change anything in your life, what would it be? Which decision would it be? Thank you. I think that um, decision-wise, uh, I, I, I've always made decisions based upon a, a very short horizon. I've always thought, you know, um, this is what I'm interested in, I'll do this tomorrow. Without thinking what will come the day after tomorrow, what will 
you know, what will, where will this take me, you know, in a week, in a month, in a year, in 10 years? Um, I think that's what I would change. I would try to, I would try to do, well, for those of you who are engineers, you will understand, and the rest of you, forgive me, but I'll, I would try to optimize over a longer time horizon. Uh, instead of optimizing one step ahead, I would try to see, you know, the, uh, it's like, you know, when you play chess, you don't just play one move. If you do, you lose. You have to see three, four, ten moves ahead in order to play properly. And I haven't. And that's, I think, my biggest failure. My question is, did you really want to be what you are today? Was it your dream to be at this respectful place on which we see you today? Oh, thank you. Um, I never, I, no, uh, I never, well, I didn't dream very far away, uh, very far ahead. Um, but uh, I, to be honest, no, I, did, I, I didn't see myself here. And... Uh, and, you know, it, it took certain important decisions. Uh, for example, I had to come back here. Uh, and it took me a very long time to decide to come back here. Um, and uh, I had to become a full-time teacher. It took me a long time to do that as well. For many years, I worked in industry. I worked in research and development. I went to university. I went back to research. Um, you know, so it took many, many little steps. Uh, but I'm very happy where I am. So uh, I didn't, I didn't anticipate it, and I'm, in, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised and happy. Is a totally relating question to it. Do you think academic success is the ultimate guarantee of individual success? No, but I think it's the right thing for me. Um, I think uh, you know. I mean, you you look at at. Bill Gates, and you know he's a college dropout, right? So, so clearly, uh, not you know, academic success is not necessary for everything, uh, but it's very important uh, to some people. And um, you know, in my case, uh, you know, I like money, uh, like everybody else. I mean, I'm not saying I don't, and I have expensive tastes. I like uh, calligraphy. I like good food. You know, so sure, I'd like to have more money, but. My decisions were never motivated by that. And uh, so in that sense, um, you know, the, an academic career was, was perfect for me. Uh, I wanted intellectual fulfillment. I wanted uh, all sorts of things which I get. Uh, and I didn't particularly care about driving a, a Jaguar and, and having a, a, you know, a 100 uh, meter boat. Um, but, but there are many people uh, for whom this is not relevant. And so I don't want to judge. I don't want to say that, this, that, that what is right for me is right for everybody else. First of all, I would like to thank you for honoring us with such an amazing lecture. My question is, uh, sir, you were talking about being judgmental. Being what? Being judgmental of uh -huh. others. Um, my question is, how to free oneself from being judgmental, yet at the same time preserve one's self-identity? I mean, uh, at times we judge others or criticize others out of uh, self-preservation instincts, right? We are all competing over here for survival, and sometimes that judgmental, the act of judging others comes from self-preservation. So how to avoid this, how to avoid being judgmental, and yet, at the same time, prevent your self-identity, not be threatened. I think this is an excellent question, and it ties in to the fact. It ties into um, uh, the fact that when I say we should not be judgmental, um, one could very justifiably ask, "Do you mean that everything goes? Do you mean that there is no right or wrong? Do you, you know, are you completely relativistic?" And um, no, I'm not. Uh, I don't think everything goes. I, I'm not uh, relativistic. Um, and I think that preserving one's self, uh, one's identity, and one's uh, 
perception of oneself is, uh, are very, very important. But I think judgmentalness um, fails in the following sense. Uh, we are who we are, and some, or I am who I am, and you are who you are. And when I judge you, I'm measuring you against my own standards. And that is what is wrong. In other words, um, I should live by my standards, but I cannot expect you to live by my standards, and vice versa. I think this is difficult to do because, um, you know, we, we do have a tendency to just uh, feel, okay, if I'm doing this this way, then this is the right way. And if he's not doing it, then he's doing it wrong. And this is a fight that we have to, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not easy to be humble. Uh, and I think this is something we have to, to, uh, to struggle with, uh, to remember that just as, let's say, you are an other to me, I am an other to you. And, and in that sense, there's absolutely no difference between you and me. So all I can hope to do is do the right thing by my standards. Uh, I have to try my best, and I don't always succeed, not to judge you by my standards, but only by your own. So that's... I think so, oh, definitely, definitely. My question is, uh, I want to hear the story about the cat. How did you, uh, like, bring it home? Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, so what happened was this. Uh, so first of all, I was all my life I was a dog person, and I would, uh, I you know, I I didn't mind cats, but I was not a, a big cat lover. Um, and then last uh, June, a friend of mine who is a, a fanatical animal rights activist uh, called me, and she said that uh, somebody had thrown two baby, you know, kittens to her garden. Uh, and they were starving, uh, one of them was unconscious, uh, and so immediately she took them to the vet, and they stayed at the vet for about 10 days with serum and all kinds of things, and one of them was nursed back to life, and the other died. And uh, apparently she found the people who had brought the kittens to the yard, and they claimed, and I, they're probably saying the truth, that they'd found a whole litter, all the other kittens were already dead. So these were the only ones living, and they brought them to that garden because they knew that somebody fed animals. So this was the only survivor of the whole family. Okay? And I just felt an incredible bond. Um, so after the vet, um, uh, uh, a, uh, Esma, who was here, um, I don't know if she's still here, but uh, Esma took the cat to her home for about a week, 10 days. Uh, and then uh, she has a bird, and cats kind of like birds, but not in the right way. Um, so she couldn't keep the cat. Um, and so we brought it here to this building, and in fact, I left it in the backyard because, you know, the, cat is, the cats are fed there and all of that. So one night, and then in the morning the following day, I went and I saw the cat. It was sleeping in a corner right by the, uh, where the, the, the tray is, the food tray. And it looked so tiny and so vulnerable. And I just could not leave it. I, I immediately grabbed it and I took it home. And, and I'm very happy I did. I mean, it has, it has changed my life, really. So that's the story. Um, hello, sir. Um, my question is, when I think about my life, when I think about my future, uh, I can find no, no reason to, to do things. And that's my question. Where do you get your life energy from? <laughs> Sometimes I fell into despair. I'm too pessimistic. I can't study. I can't learn. I can't do funny things. Um, I think, look, doing, doing fun things, doing, um, you know, uh, I think all of this is necessary. And uh, as far as the energy to do more than that, um, I think it's some sort of faith. I think it's, it's some sort of um, faith in the need to do something. I think that, that it's, it's very energizing when you feel that there is so much to change in the world. And if you can have a tiny, weeny, little, you know, a uh, micron of a, of, a, of, of a contribution to that change, that that's, it's worth doing. Um, 
So now, on the other hand, uh, I don't mind telling you this. Uh, you know, it's kind of a self-disclosure, but I don't mind telling you this. You know, I battled depression in the past. Uh, I saw a doctor. I took medication. So you know, I am. I'm very familiar with the notion of having no energy, no passion, no uh, nothing. And uh, fortunately, thank God, I'm, I'm over that phase of my life. Um, and, um, you know, it, depending on uh, whether you are apathetic or depressed, uh, either, you know, you might want to think about all the contributions that you could make to the world, because I know you and you could, uh, or if you are depressed, then you might want to consider actually doing something about it. I benefited tremendously from it. Uh, I, one thing in Turkey is that things like that, you know, one feels I won't go to a doctor, am I crazy? And it's not just, it's not just for crazies. I mean, everybody benefits. So if, if, the, if it is depression, you should do something about it. If it's apathy, I think you might just maybe look at yourself and say, I can do something to change the world. I can make the world a more beautiful place. And maybe that will motivate you. If not, just have fun. It's okay to have fun. Hojan? Hojan? Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for the lecture. I have one question. Uh, the advices that you gave us, uh, they are very good and will be very helpful in our lives, but how can we not just let them be in our notebooks and just memorize them, but to use them. Because we know that people and usually easily lose orientation in their life. So is there something that can keep us on the track, not, not to forget what are our priorities and what we need to do? How to use these advices? You're all asking very difficult questions. I was hoping for easy questions. Um, I think uh, maybe the answer would be as follows. Um, I think you were in my critical thinking course, right? And one, one thing that I uh, said there is that when we try to communicate, uh, in fact, I said it, I think, in class just yesterday, when we try to communicate, we must know not only the content of what we are going to communicate, but also the reason. What are we trying to communicate and why? Um, and I think it's the same thing about, about our lives. Ultimately, um, you know, why are we here and what are we trying to do? Um, I think uh, there are lots of people who are happy sailing through life, just, just, you know, taking things as they come. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I'm not judging. Um, but for some of us, that is not enough. And if it's not enough, then we have to think, you know, what would I want to do? Um, now, I, um, I, re I noticed, for example, uh, I spent several years uh, being a sort of father to uh, somebody else's child. Um, and uh, I realized that, for example, raising a child in the sense of giving a ch this child a future, of, of, of shaping him for a future, was an incredibly fulfilling thing. Okay? So, that could be one's goal in life. And there are many people for whom that is the goal. Um, certainly for me, uh, my job here, for example, um, interacting with students is what I like best about the job. And, and otherwise, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do this. So in a way, I think what, you, what I'm trying to say is that you, know, you have to sort of think hard about um, you know, who am I and what, am I, what, what are my priorities in life? What do I want to do? And I realize you're saying that is very difficult, and I know that. Um, and I, I zigzagged a, a whole lot in my life, you know. But um, so there, there is no way to hurry this. You know, there is no way to make it happen fast. Um, but I think that's the only way that you will, you know, you have to find your own directions. Nobody else can can impose that on you. Because if they do, it will be like a patch, you know? It won't, it won't match who you are. So for you to, to really be committed to it, for you to be invested in it, um, you have to reach it yourself. And uh, it could be, you could become a, a great dancer, or a great scientist, or a great politician, uh, or, uh, you know, whatever. And whatever you do, um, let, let me, actually, I just remembered something. So I was giving a, a, a talk 
uh, at uh, Sharika in, in Sharjah uh, some years ago at the opening of a, of a museum. And it was, there was a, uh, not an opening of a museum, of an exhibition. And the exhibition was of calligraphy. And somebody asked me, um, you know, since a lot of calligraphy is religious in nature, whether the, the art of calligraphy was a more spiritual, more, more religious, you know, kind of art. And by coincidence, I had just read in the, uh, in the Halij Times, which is the newspaper there, I just read a very interesting story that morning, which is that the, uh, the sheikh uh, uh, of Dubai had just honored some, some guy who had been a garbage collector for something like 60 years or something, you know, an enormously long time. And they had interviewed him, saying, you know, how do you find the, the stamina to do this for so long? And he had said, I take it uh, as worship, ibadah. You know, I, I take it, I take my work as worship. And it was a great, wonderful coincidence that I had read that that morning, because I said, ultimately, every work is worship, not just calligraphy, not just writing prayers. And so if you're dedicated to what you do, it's like worship, and you're going to be good at it. Uh, so I think the only way you're going to be dedicated to it is if you find your own way. Um, because of time, we'll take only one quick last question. Uh, Akhlai asked before. Uh, first of all, thank you for all your lessons and thank just you. being with us in our university. Um, you said, could it be, like, we have to question ourselves, that, like, could it be the person that I meant to be close to? And I think it's hard. And, but I want to ask, like, how much will it contribute? Will it, like, help only me? to take things easier and make my life easy, easier, or? No, I think, I think it's, uh, it's actually m uh, much more than that, because uh, in a way, you know, a lot of our lives is based upon competition, upon suspicion, upon, you know, dislike, upon hatred. Uh, and um, think about a world where everybody approaches their neighbor with that question, where everybody says, Maybe this person and I are meant to be friends. Maybe we are meant to be close to each other. Um, now, you may find that it doesn't work. I'm not, I mean, you, one cannot be best friends with everybody, um, by definition, almost. Um, but on the other hand, it gives you a positive attitude in approaching other people. And that's something we really badly need, I think. Because, um, I mean, just go out into the street, go into traffic in Istanbul, and, and you know, you see immediately how the anger that pours out of people. People are so um, ready to, as to assume the worst about you. You know, if your car has, if you stop your car, people start honking because they think you're stupid and you have no reason to stop. But that's not the case. People don't stop for no reason. So, I mean, assuming the best about other people um, will result in less people yelling, screaming at each other in traffic, for one thing, you know? So, what I think is that this would lead to a better world if, if our attitudes towards other people started. It's like, you know, in court, you have to be, you're innocent until proven guilty. So, I think you should like people until you're proven that you should dislike them. If you start at that point, I think we'll, we'll have a much better society. Thank you.